All right, let us begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that we can gather together openly and study um, what, uh, what your doctrine is as given through the hand of your servant, Philip Melanchthon. We ask as, you, as we continue our study of the book of Concord and specifically the first few articles of the Apology of the Augsburg uh, Confession, that you help give us a greater understanding, uh, especially in regards to just how we stand justified uh, before your throne. Uh, and the comfort that we can take in your promises through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, so last week at the end of this section, we were doing a uh, kind of a historical introduction to how, um, how we got between the Augsburg Confession and the apology to the Augsburg Confession. Part of that go-between was the big packet of papers that I gave you all. Um, I've got a copy of it in this book. Um, called the Confutation. Now, the Confutation, remember, was the Roman Catholic response to the Augsburg Confession, right? Um, and as we get into the Augsburg Confession a little bit, especially when we get in here to the, the greeting that Melanchthon gives, remember, this is Melanchthon's response only. So he takes, takes it, he leaves Augsburg, he goes back to Wittenberg, um, where he puts together this response over months of kind of sitting by himself and reflecting over these things. He still doesn't have a, an actual copy of what we now have uh, of the confutation. It's only pieced together from notes that, that were taken during, yeah. uh, during the, the proceedings themselves. Um, Inside this beginning of the confutation, or the uh, uh, apology of the Augsburg Confession, in his letter uh, to the reader, right? So he's kind of, this is his introduction here. Um, and he says that um, the reason why he writes this is that he can't in good conscience not respond to the Roman Catholics. Remember the Roman Catholics had asked uh, before the confutation was even read, they wanted the Lutherans to say that they agreed with it and that they wouldn't respond. Yeah, Charles. If they would have convened a council like mm -hmm. Luther wanted, yep. would things have really been different? I don't know that they would have because the council that Luther wanted ended up being the Council of Trent. And the Council of Trent didn't budge on any of these things. Well, that, that, I knew that was a rebuttal, but... Uh, yeah. Could it have changed the whole if, concept? If a, so if a, if a, we, put it this way, could it have prevented the... The, the Reformation, the actual place? sprit? Um, it could. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that because it, it all would have depended on what the attitude was going into the council. I don't think it would have. Because remember, the Pope is the only one that can convene the council. And because the Pope is the only one that convened the council, right when this all happened, the Pope dispatched Cardinal Cajetan a very able and impressive theologian. And Cajetan was also pastoral in his approach, but the Pope told him to go and shut the monk up. And that's what he came to Luther knowing, that he, at the end of the day, there was no discussion. He had to close Luther's mouth. And Cajetan, for all of his, his abilities, couldn't do that, but the two men were never able to actually sit and talk to one another about Could it these have things. Been a, a form of prejudice based on the hierarchy because you know they came from the aristocracy. Yeah, well, I mean, it was all it was all about authority. Yeah, it was all about authority. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Could it have been something that involved that? Well, I mean, some of the certainly some of those things were pointed to, but um, if you're the Pope and you have absolute power over the church and someone questions your authority to do things. Some drunken German monk. Yeah, right? Questions your, your authority to do, to do these things. There, there's no, I mean, there was no, there was no I, good I, court I've held. I've come to the conclusion that, you know, if Luther would have been wrong, I mean, if he'd have been totally wrong, he'd it would have went silence. away. It, his, his movement would have went nowhere. Yeah, right. Well, it yeah. did, it proliferated. I mean, you know, so... But I agree with you to an extent, uh, but also on the other side of that, right, um... We don't believe that the Islamic faith is right, and that's a movement that is blown up. Well, that right. That that is that that's political. I mean, that what that Islamic stuff isn't that they're they're like 
They recognized Christ as a right, but it's still it's still a faith that we don't believe is the true faith that has millions of me members, right? So you can't you can't base the number of people or the success of a movement on if it's true or not. You you just can't. Unless They're, you're a church growth or unless you're a church growth movement person. Because yeah, you know you know they call their their big head ministers imams, imams, imams. Yeah. But it's I am. It comes. It translates to that. And I, That's not the same thing. I, it doesn't mean the it same. Is. No, it doesn't mean the same thing. Uh, an imam is not uh, is not a uh, kind of a fill in for God. It's that's that's not it at all. No, it, it, you know that all this stuff sort of starts coming together. I mean, with the crusades and all that going on at the same right. time. Right. Let's let's focus on the apology though. Okay. We're getting we're getting kind of way yeah, over I, here with the what's going on and and and. Islam and Islam plays a role in this because this is one of the reasons that that remember Charles V has the ability to focus on this right now because there's nothing blowing up with the the Ottoman Turks at this time. I, I, that was that has been a question of mine for a while. Well, I mean, it's hard. Council it, would have proceeded in a proper way. Yeah, so, if a council would have been proceeded in a proper way, and you would have had people come to it, then there's a, a real possibility. I can't definitively tell you because the Roman Catholic Church did not change their views on any of Luther's positions until Vatican II. World War II stopped them. They, they want to change it before that, but well, I mean, either way, you're talking. I mean, you're talking 400 years that they oh, yeah. that they were solid in not affirming anything of what is Luther. That? So I, I can't answer if a, if a well, council would have been called. Most of that originated in Germany, which is surprising. At all, yeah. Yeah, I mean... In this, the 50s, this, they, were, they were dealing with it. But... Are you talking about for the, the, the pre-Vatican II stuff? Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. came from the Fulda bishops' conferences, but World War II interfered with it. Right. Once again, let's go back, though, to the 1500s and focus on what Melanchthon is telling us. Uh, the ramifications of all these things are important. I don't mean to shortchange that, but we won't get through this if we spend all of our time in the last hundred years. Um, so, if you read the confutation, uh, you will see that the prologue part, right, they ec the, the Roman Catholic responders to the Augsburg Confession echo some of the language that Charles had talked about. It echoed the need for a thorough and thought thoughtful consideration Right? It says that they, they do these things. And by the time this gets distilled down, if you just read that prologue, you would have no idea that we actually had, uh, that they had actually went through five revisions before you got here. Right? There's no indication of any of those things. But this was all the, the conglomeration of all their notes. That's not, that's not, that's the actual confutation. Oh, so we, yeah. So what you what I have given you is the actual okay. confutation because we do have it now. They just didn't give it to Melanchthon to write the apology. What he writes the apology did, off of, it? huh? When did they? I have no idea. Okay. I have absolutely I no idea. It, like it might say it. Time. Um, let me see if it says it in here in this historical introduction. Uh, first published in fifteen fifty nine. Okay, twenty nine years after. Twenty nine years after the fact. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. Appreciate you. Um, so uh, inside this, though, they talk about the fact that they are, are to judge what is good within the writings of the Reformers, especially the Augsburg Confession, and to judge where they think that they have, have erred. erred, right? And that's exactly what they were tasked with doing. And, and if you read this, I hope you were struck with the, the – by the time they got to this version, it wasn't – it wasn't nasty. They actually did a decent job of, of writing it by the time they went got to the fifth version. But remember, they had 228 folios that they brought forth the first time, and they were admonished by the emperor to go back and try again because of their tone and the sheer volume of their stuff. Do you think they, were, they played fair, though? I think they tried to. Yeah, I think they, I think they tried to. I don't think that there was any real way they were going to get a fair shake. And I think by this, this time, you're starting on two very different sides of, of an interpretation of justification, and that will color everything else. And we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight when we get into that article. 
So then when Melanchthon writes his prologue, his letter to the reader, he appeals to the exact same thing that Luther appealed to at the Diet of Worms. Remember, Luther, Luther appeals to Scripture and his own conscience. That's exactly what he appeals to. And the same thing with Melanchthon. Uh, our princes had heard that many articles were disapproved, which they could not abandon without offense to conscience. They asked that a copy of the confutation be furnished them, that they might be able both to see what the adversaries condemned and to refute their arguments. But they never got it. And so this and Melanchthon talks about how they assemble the what they're writing uh, against. Um, and so... Even then, Melanchthon, because he's writing after the fact, uh, is pointing towards the fact that the, the emperor demanded that adherence be given to the confutation. They all held themselves up as, as having won this, uh, this battle, that the, the articles were condemned from Scripture. Um, and so Melanchthon's saying, no, you haven't won the battle. We still don't believe that you have refuted us. And so we're going to come back at it. One of the things I think that is very uh, important to realize in Melanchthon's prologue is the fact that he consistently points towards a desire for concord. He wants the sides to be reconciled. Now, wanting the sides to be reconciled and knowing that they will be or believing that they can be are two different things. And we don't get an, inclin an indication that he knows that they're going to be reconciled or thinks that they might be. Um, but he is, he is believing at this point in time that at least the theologians that wrote the confutation are essentially not worried about truth. They're not worried about... Um, bringing the two sides together anymore. They're worried about simply winning the argument. And I think that's pretty pointed. In, inside, if you're, if you're trying to follow along with where I'm at, uh, inside the preface here, um, I'm in, let's see, it has always been my custom, uh, 11. Um, and Melanchthon says that, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm in 12. Uh, but the adversaries are treating the case in such a way as to show that they are seeking neither truth nor concord, but to drain our blood. In other words, they want to; they just want to win. There's that's all they're worried about. Um, kind of feels like our political climate <laughs> nowadays, right? No one's actually concerned about the actual truth. Both sides just want to put the other side down and win the day. And uh, that's what Melanchthon is seeing uh, in in the opponents at this point in time. Um, okay. Uh, he also, once again, focusing on, on, on coming together, uh, he says that the, the Lutherans don't enjoy the discord that has happened. They don't desire the discord. They don't want it. Um, and he actually ends this uh, with a, a beautiful prayer. If anybody, if you didn't take the time to read it, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out loud. So Melanchthon ends his, his letter to the reader. Lord Jesus Christ, it is thy holy gospel. It is thy cause. Look thou upon the many troubled hearts and consciences, and maintain and strengthen in thy truth thy churches and little flocks, who suffer anxiety and distress from the devil. Confound all hypocrisy and lies, and grant peace and unity, so that thy glory may advance and thy kingdom, strong against all the gates of hell, may continually grow and increase. So a, a beautiful prayer to, to close his comments. Um, any questions on the his history leading up to this point or the, the preface from either the confutation side or what Melanchthon's written? Any questions? Martins, any questions? Everybody good? All right. So the first article then uh, is the article on God. And if you read the confutation, you will, will remember. Or if you just listened uh, when I gave you the history, this was one that was not... Uh, contested by the Roman Catholics. They, they uh, affirmed it, and they affirmed it on the basis of our creeds, right? They're, they're showing the creedal belief in God. Um, interesting, as we kind of glance through here on what Melanchthon, um, so you would, you would expect that he wouldn't treat a whole lot, but yet he, he expounds the, the view again, right? So he, he talks about one divine, undivided essence, Three distinct persons and one divine essence. Um, and that anybody that thinks otherwise stands outside of the church. So if you don't think that about, about God being three in one, 
um, one undivided essence and yet three distinct persons, then you're outside of the church. And no one was arguing that. Not really, no. I mean, you still had uh, the kind of the heretical groups. There, there are groups at this time. Right. That, big, uh, that big list of stuff that I gave you might list some at the time of the Reformation. Uh, that may have have uh, the list of ancient heresies. Yeah, that big big monstrous thing that it, that I gave you all the first uh, first day of class that might help. Um, let me see if I had any notes uh, in the confutation. Um, the 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 Catholic delegation points to the Council of Nicaea, where we get the Const- Constantinople Nicene Creed, um, and they they echo the condemnation of the specific heresies, which is um, interesting because when we get into the article on justification, the, the Roman Catholic theologians are actually going to say that the Lutherans are Manichaeans, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit about why they think that. The second article is on the article of original sin, and there, here there is some difference between the two. Um, what the Roman Catholics... Uh, theologians uh, agreed with was that uh, original sin is inherited sin, that it is truly sin, and that Pelagians are condemned. Pelagians are the ones that say without the the grace, the aid of God's grace, we can actually love God, Um, which is interesting because they affirm that in regards to original sin, but then when that plays into the article of justification, their view, the Roman Catholic view, is, is going to be uh, kind of a works righteousness where you are earning things uh, on your own merit. And we'll talk about how, how they can reconcile those two or how they try to when we get into the, the fourth article. Um, what they reject, though, is that the Lutherans believe that because we're born in this sinful state, because we are born with original sin, and what is known as concupiscence, and once again, there's a difference in definition between concupiscence between the Lutherans and the Roman Catholics. But the Lutherans are going to say that we cannot fear, love, and trust in God before regeneration. We can't, before faith is worked in us, before regeneration in the waters of baptism, we don't assent to God in any way. Um, and the Roman Catholics reject that. They say that that um, that you you can, uh, and what they also reject is the fact that Lutherans will say that this is truly sin, even before the age of reason. So my four-year-old son actually and truly sins before the age of reason. They make this distinction because as a child is still learning, um, they don't have the ability to really reflect before they do something. Right. So um, my boys get mad at one another. Uh, One hits the other. It's not like he stopped and thought about it. It just became an instantaneous response because he doesn't have the intellectual capability yet to to reason it. Now, Lutherans will say that doesn't matter because of original sin. You're already born in a sinful condition anyhow, and you have this predisposition to sin, which is why you don't have to think about it to do the wrong thing. It becomes natural (laughs) for one to hit the other. Um, and so there's a big difference here um, in, in we thought. Would, we would even say that unborn children stand condemned before the Correct. eyes of God. Correct. Yep. They do stand condemned before the eyes of God, but we also would say that unborn children can also possess faith, having heard the word in the womb. If the mother comes to church, have you ever seen people talking to the kid in the womb? It's because the baby can hear. And if faith comes through hearing, it doesn't say faith comes through understanding, but faith comes through hearing. So you can say that the child has faith. It's the same argument of why we baptized infants also. Are you confused about this? No, I'm just, uh, no, I'm, I'm thinking of something else that would, using that same line of thinking, then like speaking in tongues, we usually say, you know, I'd rather speak five eligible words that are, you know, intelligible sure. than 5,000 in tongue that no one can understand. But if I'm speaking in the tongues of angels and I'm speaking the word, let's just say theoretically. Right? Sure. Uh, if that was such a thing. Uh, and uh, I'm speaking the word and no one understands it. St. Paul would say, only I am being edified. No one else is. I mean, maybe I'm not even being edified because 
you know, I'm there's nothing happening up here. Right. Well, but then I mean, it's hard you know to it's I mean? hard, yes, it's but it's hard to make an example off of something that we don't actually. But we, but we so condemn this, that because we would say, hey, there's no interpreter. Well, shut and, up. Yeah, that's it, that's, ex, that's exactly it, right? So there is, there is no interpreter. So there uh, needs and to be. reading God's word, uh, in in a language. I mean, I think that's different than someone f- free miking the tongue of angels. Well, practically speaking, yeah, it's for, you know they're just a it's direct. Utterance. It's direct inspiration, right? Yeah, it's directly from God out their mouth. Right. Yeah. So there's there's nothing to to base that off of. Uh, there's nothing to um, you need the word, the external word, the Bible to check what is happening there. What. I am saying, and what the Lutherans have said from the from the beginning of this in regards to children and faith, is that the the word of God, that's where the power lies, is is in in actual scripture, the reading of scripture. That is what generates faith because God is in scripture. He is present where his word is present. And they may say the same argument with speaking in tongues, but we have the external word to check any utterances out of the mouth against. Whereas if someone speaks in tongues and no one understands it, you don't have anything to check it against. See, I always felt like you know speaking the word there would need to be understanding or for any kind of. For well, then that puts that puts the power and efficacy and, on a human being's understanding uh, and, and not and see, the word of God. And, and I get that, but again, if I go in and no one understands, no one's ever going to be like, I don't know what you're saying. So you're you're telling me that God. all the people in the faith that didn't know the Latin language and went to Latin mass, there was no faith worked. I don't understand okay. that because if it, like, if there was no common language being spoke whatsoever during the service, right? The whole service, but there's still an understanding. I mean, you can go to a Latin mass because and the preaching, understand. Is that in Latin too? I don't know. I probably. This was Luther's point, though. That's right? odd. Okay, so this is, but this is the point. The efficaciousness, the efficaciousness is in the word. Okay, um, let's stop going down that rabbit hole. You guys are going to get me so off track tonight <laughs> that we're not even going to actually get through any of the articles. Um, so, the what Melanchthon is trying to get in here, uh, into here, and you'll notice that if you read through this, there's kind of some technical language that comes comes involved. Um, Melanchthon is going to talk about um, since the fall of Adam all men who are naturally born are conceived and born in sin that is that they all from their mother's womb are full of evil desire and inclination and have by nature that's important by nature no fear of God and no true faith in God so this is before baptism this is the state of the child this is the nature of the child. Now, what, what Melanchthon's doing here is he is setting this as the foundation that all human beings, this, so this is devoid from a conversation of faith, but all human beings are in fact born in this way. And it's not simply the guilt of original sin, which is where the Roman Catholic side is going to go, but that original sin is actually a sinful a sinful act. It is part of sin. Now, this concept of concupiscence is a big one, and it comes up over and over again. In the Roman Catholic view of concupiscence, um, I don't think they even, did they define it in here for us? So the only thing that they do is that they, they say in the confutation, also rejected is their teaching that inherited or original sin is concupiscence if they mean that concupiscence is a sin that remains a sin in a child after their baptism. So where the Roman Catholics are drawing the line is after baptism. So this is, once again, how are you justified, in what manner are you justified, and what happens after regeneration are big questions here. After someone is baptized... So if you have the Roman Catholic view, baptism is going to cleanse from original sin. And then any sin committed after baptism has to be cleansed. And this is what Jesus has died for. For original sin. 
to remove you out of that sinful condition. After this, because of receiving the Holy Ghost, any sin committed is cleansed through confession and penance. Okay? Any sin not cleansed through confession and penance is cleansed in purgatory before getting to heaven. They don't really do child baptism, do then do they? Yeah, they do. Wouldn't make sense. Well, why waste that? Like, just get out of jail free card. The yeah. So this this is kind of a rebuttal against this kind of thinking, right? Why would you do any baptism unless it's on the deathbed? Yeah. I mean, right. That's the your um, safest bet. But what they would say is because of the grace that you receive. Because remember, they we've got two, maybe a third sacrament, but they've got seven that extend through the whole life of the church. So the grace that you get infused with continues to be infused at confirmation and in marriage and, and so on and so forth. And penance. So that's where you get this infusion of grace that allows you to, to not sin. Um, so this is that view. Because of this, concupiscence is located here in original sin, and it is just a, ten, a tender, a predisposition to sin, and is not actual sin itself. The Lutheran view is very different than this. The Lutheran view is that we are all born in a sinful condition, and that condition is damning. It is, from its onset, damning. And concupiscence is not just a disposition to sin, it is actual sin. And it is sin that is sin enough to actually damn us. In baptism, we are regenerated, but the process of sanctification continues throughout all of life, and it's cyclical. It doesn't get step-by-step step better and better and better each day until you can reach perfection so in this world. We don't believe in progressive sanctification. We do not believe in progressive sanctification. No. That doesn't mean that you don't learn from mistakes. So the repetition of the same sins... Um, in the exact same way, you know, if you're not learning from that, then, then you have to have discussions to figure out how you can fix that. Um, but the fact that we continue to fall into sin, even falling into sin, but it hitting you from a different way, right? Because of, of the way we as Lutherans believe the attacks of the devil are. He's smart, right? He pokes and prods for weak spots, and that's where he attacks. So you shore up one thing, and he figures out a different way. To, to get you. If you've ever been um, involved in people that are very good manipulators, this is what they do. It's the same thing, except Satan's much better at it, right? They'll poke and prod, and if they don't get you to do what they want this way this time, then they'll try another route to get you to do what they want. So there's a big difference here uh, in the whole life of the believer, and what Melanchthon is trying to get at here is that all of this kind of is based on um, the kind of interjection of philosophy into theology coming out of the medieval period. So you get uh, medieval theologians that are reading a lot of Aristotle, and in Aristotle you find um, kind of the perfection of humankind in this world. And when you take that and you apply it then to theology especially if you use philosophy to view theology, which is what the Lutherans believed that the Roman Catholics at this time were doing, uh, and not theology as the lens by which you evaluate philosophy, which is the good and right way to use philosophy, right? Can we appropriate certain things rightfully, understanding theology first, whereas the other way is very human-centric yeah. philosophy, uh, appropriating theology, um, and so he talks about different things. Um, let's see. The Lutheran definition of concupiscence then that Melanchthon sets forth is going to be found, uh, I think, at the end of 6 um, in Article 2. And he's going to say, To show this impious opinion is displeasing to us, we made mention of concupiscence, and with the best intention have termed and explained it as diseases, that the nature of men is born corrupt and full of faults, 
not a part of man, but the entire person with its entire nature is born in sin as with a hereditary disease. So that the human being is completely infected with this disease of concupiscence, of original sin. Um, and that's the big difference between the two, is that the Roman Catholic view is it's just the, the original state of having a predisposition to sin and is not sin itself. Um, and so uh, another word that uh, Melanchthon is going to use through here is called fomes. That's the, the Latin word for kind of that, that evil inclination, right, that you have a predisposition to do something. Um, well, that predisposition, we would say, would be a fruit of the already fallen. Yeah, of the already fallen nature. So kind of right. getting there. Is yeah. So uh, they don't. They don't come all. There? They don't come all the way out and say that. Um, that the the fomes, the inclination is um, is a original fruit sin. of of original sin. They say it. It's kind of well. They don't use that language. Uh, but they do equate the two. Because of original sin and because concupiscence is actual sin, then these evil inclinations are, are also is part of is actual sin. Yes. The Roman Catholics well, believe concupiscence. it was original sin. But, but for the Lutherans, original sin, when I mean actual, I don't mean physically committed. I mean sin that is damning. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's sin that can be imputed against you. All right. Uh, original sin, even though original sin, you could make the you and this is what the Roman Catholics do, make the argument that, well, I didn't commit original sin. It wasn't an act that I did as a baby. I right. Don't think God cares. And he doesn't. And that's the Lutheran's points. This is this is why they call it sophistry. A sophist was someone who argued these fine points making distinctions and using rhetoric to try to well, I think trip up. Are important. Distinctions are important yeah. also, but but when you make this kind of distinction, it leads one to believe that, I mean, you see where they take it then after baptism, that you can do this, that you can work and have things pleasing to God, or that you can be perfect in this life. And the Lutherans are saying, no, you cannot. I mean, even with the aid of the Holy Spirit, because because we have not completely shed our sinful self, even after regeneration, we still but the, their go idea back. of original sin is that it, it original sin is in itself inherently not damning. Original sin is simply the predisposition to sin. To and it's not actual sin. So then they believe we're all born perfect. They wouldn't go so far as that. Once again, I don't distinctions. <laughs> to get to get involved in this, you have to actually go through and read their writings to see how they they make these arguments. It's that different. It's, it is, yeah. This is why I always tell you that I love a lot of the things about the Roman Catholic Church, but there's a few things I don't, and those few things that I don't would never allow me to be Roman Catholic. Mm. Pure and simple. This is one of those things. It's, one of those, it's fundamental. Though. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you'll see how this bleeds into, into justification, too, because as you can imagine... That the ramifications of what you merit and what Christ has merited are huge. What Christ has taken care of, there's a difference in what Christ has actually died for between the two. And it's, it's a big difference. Okay, so uh, Melanchthon then is going to, um, in 13 and 14, he is going to, uh, to get to where he's talking about what the actual problem is. And this is where he gets into that, that reliance upon philosophy. So he says in, in 13, But after the scholastics, scholastics mingled with Christian doctrine, philosophy concerning the perfection of nature, and ascribed to the free will and acts springing therefrom more than was sufficient, and taught that men are justified before God by philosophic or civil righteousness, they could not see the inner unclean, uncleanness of the nature of men. For this cannot be judged except from the word of God, of which the scholastics in their discussions do not frequently treat. So what Melanchthon is, is accusing them of is, in their use of philosophy, they spend so much time making these philosophical distinctions, because a lot of these distinctions come from Aristotle, using his method. Uh, and making those distinctions, they have gone past Scripture. And now they're spending all of their time using these philosophical distinctions mm -hmm. to try to parse these things out to where it is now put them in a place where going back and checking it with Scripture 
conflicts, and that's what the Lutheran's point is, that Scripture doesn't speak like this, like that. Um, this is like an extreme case of magisterial logic. Absolutely. Right? This is exactly magisterial logic. Yep. Yep. Um, whereas the Lutherans are trying to point back to ministerial logic. Yep. Um, so, the big points then for the Lutherans, what does concupiscence, what does original sin actually do? And this is where we're going to get into, especially in 14. He's going to outline it and he'll repeat these things over and over again. Original sin, this disease, this concupiscence that we all have, makes us ignorant of God, makes us actually ha hold God in contempt. Then we have no fear, no trust, and an inability to love. So essentially what Melanchthon is doing is beautifully tying this into the first commandment. Because of original sin and concupiscence, we cannot hope to keep the first commandment. And because we cannot keep the first commandment, all the rest of them fall. And that's where he is, he's building. And he's building it right on that language, right? So Luther in the explanation of the first commandment, uh, what does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God in all things. And, and Melanchthon is going to time and time again talk about how we do not fear love God. We do not fear God, love God, or trust in God. And that is where he locates the problem and what, what concupiscence actually prevents us from doing, what original sin does. And we would say it still prevents us even after conversion. Yeah, even, even post-conversion, uh, we, uh, we still have the effects of the old Adam within us. And it has to be, as Luther says, a daily drowning of the old Adam. Um, and even then, we, he still re rears his ugly head throughout our lives. And that's, that's from Daily. simple, simple experience. Yeah, minutely, yeah. <laughs> right? Secondly. Um, and I think it's really interesting then, uh, once he moves past this, he goes actually into um, what it means to be created in the image and likeness of God and what it means that we have lost the image and likeness of God in sin. And so he's doing this at the, let's see, 19 and 20. Um, scripture testifies this when it says, Genesis 127, that man was fashioned in the image and likeness of God. What else is this than that were, there were embodied in man a wisdom and righteousness as apprehended God and in which God was reflected? That is, to man there were given the gifts of the knowledge of God, the fear of God and confidence in God and other gifts like these. The knowledge of God? Yeah, so knowing who God is, knowing God is there uh, and not in... Uh, so Adam and Eve... Are we talking about natural knowledge? No, what, what he is talking about... Genesis 127, this is what it meant that Adam and Eve were created in the image and likeness of God, that they actually had fear, love, and trust in God. That was a likeness. Yes. The ability to actually apprehend God as God, which animals do not have. And then this is lost in original sin. Or this is lost in the fall. So we don't have the image of God anymore. Correct. Yeah. A lot of people will say that the Roman Catholic Church will say that the, the image of God is reason. That we have reason. Uh, and yes, we do have the ability to reason, but reason must be ordered by fear love and trusting in God. If not, reason will take you down a wrong path. <laughs> so you, so this is the diff, another fundamental difference between the two, the reliance upon human reason as being the image of God and having not lost said image of God in the fall on the Roman Catholic side. The Lutherans are going to say, no, the image of God is to understand God as God, to fear him, to love him, and to trust in him above all things. And in the fall, that is lost. And you would think that he would consider God the epitome of logic. So anything he does is the standard by which we define what is logical and illogical. So when we say that we have logic, we have a distorted yeah. Reflection of that logic. Yes. And and oftentimes it's illogical because sin often, is often, always illogical. And oftentimes we use that that distorted logic to circumvent God, which is the Lutheran's accusation of this. If Christ only dies for original sin, once again this is getting a little bit more into the fourth article on justification. If Christ only dies for original sin and you have to make it work after that. <laughs> You have circumvented via human logic what Christ has actually accomplished.
for you on the cross, and you have once again turned upon yourself to make yourself capable of these things, and that's not. And now, of course, they would say capable of these things in regards to an infusion of grace, um, but even then, there's some sophistic distinctions that are that are important. It's almost like they're just clinging on to. I think the point that they're trying to say is, well, I made the decision. I made the decision. I mm-hmm. took that step yeah. forward. He helped me, but I took that step right. forward. Yep. Whereas Lutherans are going to say, I didn't want to take the step forward, and he came and pulled me. Yeah, I was kicking <laughs> and screaming. Yep. Oh. And then I, once, I, once he made me take the first step, then I can cooperate with him. That's for a few, for a few steps, before, right, before you start dragging your feet, right. right? Just always believe that Christ died for all sins. All sins, right, yeah. And this, is, this gets into a Lutheran view of universal atonement that we kind of talked about Sunday, right? That, that Christ does die for all sins of all people, believers and unbelievers alike, on the cross. That is where salvation is won for everyone. But salvation distributed, where, where does Tanner get that salvation? It's, yeah, that's the tricky it's word and sacrament through faith. So there's a difference between salvation earned and salvation distributed. In fact, when go when God promised the second Adam, it was right after it was right after the they were kicked out for the original sin. Right. Certainly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's, that's when You're God gonna get into your God when does faith promise. begin thing. Because you're that's a Roman because at, at, at the heart you're a Roman Catholic. How so? Well, I'm not getting into it. That is, you can't just accuse me and say, well, I'm not going to back it up right now. You know? <laughs> I've been telling you for two months in our talks no, about how... you me a Calvinist. Well, you're a Calvinist, too. You're, you're just... You're, you're such a poor... You're a poor Lutheran and a poor Calvinist and a poor Roman Catholic because you conflate the things. You are like a shopping cart Christian where you just take the things that you no, like. I, I am simply an intellectual. Yeah, you see where that got them, huh? More intelligent than most of them. <laughs> so. All right. So, where's that got you in life? Being more intelligent than most. The faith of a child, baby. The faith of a child. All right. So this lack of righteousness. <laughs> this lack of righteousness um, that that we have. Uh, Melanchthon is going to go through and show how this comes out of the ancient writings of the church. And so he's going to talk specifically about Augustine. Half of the fights in the Reformation were fights over Augustine. Whose side is Augustine on? Um, And just like any of the fathers, uh, you can rip him out of context and pretty much make him say whatever you want to. Uh, And so it's really hard to, to figure those things out unless you go back and just read Augustine on his own, and then you can figure out a thing. I firmly believe that the best of Luther's theology comes from Augustine. He, he, he gets it from Augustine. If you go and read Augustine, Luther, and, and, and this is not a shot at Luther, this is actually a good thing, because if it didn't come from Augustine, then Luther really would be making up new stuff, and it's never new to have, or never good to what have... What century was Augustine? Again? Fourth. Fourth and fifth. Oh, that early. Okay. Yeah. He's pretty early. Pretty early dude. Yep. I like Augustine. So, um, this concept of, of image and the loss of image in original sin. Um, Melanchthon th- shows this is Arrhenius. Arrhenius, if you don't know, is the first generation after Christ dies and rises and ascends. So, Arrhenius is one of the earliest of the church fathers. Uh, Would he have been around during the apostles? He may have overlapped. I th- so he wasn't around with the apostles. Irenaeus learned from Polycarp, who learned from St. John. Can you imagine being close? Yeah, my teacher, my teacher learned from the disciple that Jesus loved. Yeah, yeah pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, and, and then he also quotes St. Ambrose and then Augustine. So he's got three guys within the first four centuries of the church's existence all saying that the loss of the image of God is, is through this exact original sin and that it is tied directly to a lack of knowledge, fear, and love, and trust in God. A lack of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And would you say we had knowledge? Adam and Eve certainly had knowledge. Once again, you keep, you keep shifting to us. 
They're talking about the you, loss of the image in the fall. When you said that you were talking under the assumption that before the fall. Yes. This is all, yeah. So the, all that stuff that's that I was right. talking about with image why, of God, that's, that's all. So you're talking about the natural? You know, like, you know, everyone knows. No, 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 no. no, no, no. God no. This is all what we call prelapsarian, before the fall. Okay. Right? So, hi, my wife is watching. Hi, honey. Um, this is all before the fall. So this is what it means to have lost the image of God in, in the fall into sin. And this is what Luther is saying, but it's the opposite of what these folks are saying. Even though we're pointing that Irenaeus, Ambrose, and Augustine all said that we lose the image of God because we've lost knowledge, faith, love, and fear. All of those things. And so that everything after that, after that fall, there is no natural knowledge. This is why Lutherans are so animate about not having a natural knowledge of God because we've lost it, right? You may have a natural knowledge of his law. You may be able to say a God exists because we live in an ordered world, but that, I mean, even the pagans were able to do that. <laughs> Aristotle said that, right? The Milesians said that. Um, and so you have all of these things kind of come together uh, here uh, with the church fathers that they're trying to point to. But then... Melanchthon, being Melanchthon and not being content with the early church fathers, he uses St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas is a medieval theologian, 12th century. So now we're there. He also uses St. Bonaventure, who's a medieval mystic theologian. Uh, and St. Thomas says, Original sin comprehends the loss of original righteousness, and with this an inordinate disposition of the parts of the soul, whence it is not, it is not pure loss but a corrupt habit. Uh, so sin as a habit, right? Right from the beginning. Oh, okay. So kind of like your whole, uh, vice virtue. Might be something to read in all of these guys. They're pretty smart. Yeah. Where do you think I got it? I don't come up with these things on my own. I just read. I read and I take, I'm a shopping cart theologian just like you, except I take good theologians. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, these are taken for a right now. I, I love you too. Um, and then he also cites Hugh of St. Victor, which was another um, uh, medieval theologian. Hugh of St. Victor says, Original sin is ignorance in the mind and concupiscence in the flesh. So ignorance of God in the mind and concupiscence meaning actual sin in the flesh. If you're trying to follow along, I keep, I'm getting bad about giving you paragraph numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 28, 29 is where we're, we're sitting right now. Um, sorry about that. In my English version, there is no paragraph numbers. So when I, have to, when I have to find paragraphs, I have to quickly look over at the Latin, translate down until I find the section, and then do it, which is hard when I'm trying to talk also at the same time. I'm okay at Latin, but fluent I am not. Uh, and so it does get hard to do those things. Um, all right. So one of the key points that he makes is going to happen here in 31. Uh, Melanchthon says, And the intelligent reader will readily be able to decide that to be without the fear of God and without faith are more than actual guilt, which is what they're saying. Original sin is just guilt, and Christ gets rid of the guilt uh, of original sin. It's more than actual, or it's, yeah, uh, it's more than actual guilt, for they are abiding defects in our unrenewed nature. So, pre regeneration. The nature of the human being cannot have natural knowledge of God, cannot fear God, cannot love God, cannot trust God at all, period. There is nothing that we can do before regeneration. So we're talking before faith, before baptism, right? Um, all right, let me see if there's another, another point that we can make here or if it's probably time to... Now, an interesting point, Tanner, we were talking about progressive sanctification. I wrote in the margin here, progressive question mark. Um, this would be in 35, uh, maybe even into 36. Sin baptism is remitted. Yeah, so this is 35 into 36, exactly at that transition. Uh, he also added, um, this is, who's the he? Pope Leo? Leo the 10th. Yeah. 
Right, verse six. Oh, they're, they're talking about Luther. So this was Luther's view of baptism. So he also added in re reference to the material that the Holy Ghost, given through baptism, begins to mortify the concupiscence and create new movements, a new light, a new sense and spirit in man. So not progressive, but almost like inaugurated, right? So uh, inaugurated means something that is began but not completed. So if we talk about Jesus ascending into heaven, that is a type of inaugurated eschatology, meaning that the end times have already started, but they're not complete yet. They're not complete until judgment day, right? Um, so if we talk about this in regards to sanctification, sanctification is inaugurated but not completed in this life. Baptism gives us the Holy Spirit that begins to, to affect these changes it, it in us. I thought it reached culmination at death, not at... Judgment. Yeah. yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm not equating inaugurated eschatology with inaugurated sanctification. I'm not trying to equate those two. I was just using a different example so that you would get the meaning of inaugurated. Okay. Yeah, I'm not trying to equate. I'm sorry if that was confusing. Uh, um, no, it's, yeah, at, at death, death is the final doorway. And that's when, why we don't need purgatory. That happens and our, our souls are perfected. And then, and then we do... It, it partly isn't completed, right? Because our bodies aren't cleansed until they're remade well, anew. Like the last day is not like the graduation ceremony, you know? Yeah, <laughs> kind of. Kind of a silly. Yeah, I think I I don't think that's a bad analogy though, right? But um, uh, so in in death, because our soul or our bodies aren't instantly raised and perfected. It's only our soul that is with Christ until the resurrection of the dead in the last day. And so you could, you could almost say it's a type of inauguration that is finally culminated. But there are no effects of sin on either after, right? Death is the final effect of sin. It's the final wage of sin. Um, all right, where are we sitting in time? Okay, we're doing, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. Um, let's see. Then he goes and he talks about how in Scripture these things are, are shown that he's talking, uh, talking about. Um, one thing that I think is interesting that, that might be fun to talk about a little bit, uh, and this comes into those philosophical distinctions also that we were, that we were looking at earlier. Uh, 45, I think. Yeah, 40, 44, 45. So uh, one of the things that Melanchthon is saying that the, the Roman Catholic theologians are doing is basically saying that something isn't a sin unless it's voluntary, unless it's a movement of the will. And so this is a bad distinction. So a sinful thought may not be an actual sin if it's not acted upon or dwelled upon in the Roman Catholic view. And so what he, what he says, I'll, I'll read this so, uh, so that you can... Um, Likewise, that nothing is a sin unless it is voluntary, that is, inner desires and thoughts are not sins if I do not altogether consent thereto. Meaning if you pass a beautiful woman and you think instantaneously a lustful thought and then you just move on, that... That instant thought is not a sin unless you go, ooh, I like the way that thought makes me feel, and so now I'm going to dwell in it. That's then a, a willful act. So they'd make a distinction that that was not sinful the, in the thought. But what the Lutherans are saying is, no, this, this all revolves around the, the concupiscence, the, our nature. Why do we have that thought? Because our nature is this way, that it... It thinks these things instead of thinking good things. Um, and so there's, there's a distinction it even in those. It is our nature to be sinful. It is our nature to be sinful so that, that if you have that, that is in accordance with your altogether sinful nature. Free. You look confused. Oh, just interesting. Interesting thought, that, right? Yeah. yeah. And once again, these, these are... Um, so when Jimmy Carter said, I have lusted in my heart, 
it wasn't necessarily a sin according to them. Yeah, right. So you, but if, but but even if, then, so if if she looked, if, if well, she looked, looked and there said, the uh, yeah, ooh la la, then it was a sin, right? Right. So it's it's kind of one of those things that if you to use that example, right? You pack, pass a a beautiful woman, you say she's a beautiful woman, you move on with your day, recognizing beauty for beauty's sake, probably not sinful. But then when it becomes a movement of the will, I desire that beauty for myself. And you think of the ways in which you desire said beauty. That then is, is voluntary. The word voluntary comes from voluntas, uh, will. That's the Latin word for will. So when we talk about voluntary, that is a movement, an act of your own, of your own will. Whereas Lutherans would say, no, if, if you... Uh, it, was, it would be only by God's grace that you could look at a beautiful woman, recognize beauty for beauty's sake, and move on without moving to lust. Your natural inclination, because you are sinful, altogether sinful and unclean, is then to progress to that lust. Um, and we would say that because that, that actually bodes with experience and with the way Scripture implies us after the fall. All right, describes us after the fall. So wouldn't we also say lust is just simply the... Uh, well, the perversion of the natural sexual passion to where it, instead of serving its more inward yep, yeah, selfish... Yeah, absolutely. That is, exa- that is exactly that right. Itself, that it is what will quantify what is a lust. Right. Yeah. I, I only want what I want for my sake and not so for the sake of the other. So it is possible to have lust for your wife. Yeah, absolutely. Because when you look yeah. at her, instead of thinking and, you're and, a beautiful woman, you think you're looking at her like, uh, you know, steak, yeah. you know. Right. It is absolutely possible to have lust for your wife, right? Um, and St. Paul even says this. And he says that this is the God in his wisdom has given us this good and right outlet even for our, our evil in, inclinations of lust, right? Um, and so, yeah, it is. Because I had a, I don't mean to drive it off, but uh, I, I had a couple that I knew in high, or not high school, uh, college that were married sure and the husband struggled with pornography so the wife devised that they had filmed their own <laughs> and so he would just look yeah. at that instead yeah but that's, i was thinking but that's, that's you're it's still, still lust yeah lusting after yeah. but it's my wife so it's fine right like, yeah it, you're no your abs- your inclination is absolutely right in that way the act of sex is devoid of the mutual, no the mutual, not, not only no love, but there's no mutual giving. That's, that's the point of the union, and that God makes this feel good and produces life from this. That is beautiful. A, Whereas it's, you're it's taking it, you're, yeah, you're taking it and making, making what should have been a, yeah, a beautiful act completely self-servicing. Yeah, that's exactly right. Exactly right. Okay. Um, For Melanchthon, then, he's going to talk about in 46 and 47 about how this, all of this comes into kind of an overemphasis on the strength of the human being. Um, And that when we have this overemphasis of a human being's strength, we then actually suppress the grace of Jesus. Um, We don't have a right view of this. Um, And and then he kind of, he goes into, at the end of this kind of, railing against this view, right? So we're in 47. Um, but that for their, for their non-imputation, they need the grace of Christ and likewise for their mortification, the Holy Ghost. And so when we believe in, in Luther's view that we are altogether sinful and unclean, um, we need the grace of Christ so that our own sins are not imputed to us. And we need the Holy Ghost for the mortification of our flesh so that we do not fall back into those old sinful habits. That's, that's why we need both of these things. And if we think we can do it on our own, then we, we are rejecting both the grace of Christ, right? Because the grace of Christ is the non-imputation, but their non-imputation stops here. Yeah. It doesn't extend to the actual life of the Christian. Whereas the Lutheran view says, no, Christ died for all sins. And it is because of Christ that even when we fall, those sins are not held against us because Christ has taken them 
uh, into himself. This is the, the whole beauty and purpose of the whole beautiful exchange that Luther, that Luther See, sets forth. Nothing in Scripture even seems to indicate this. Anything like yeah, that. Yeah, and that's, that's the Lutheran's they, points. That is why they are saying we can't. This is tradition. So as it, as it boils down, or as it comes out, and the, the penance becomes a sacrament, and this idea of satisfaction being necessary. Um, it probably the, had a different, penance probably had a different original re- reason for doing it, kind of to probably reinforce the, So this is, this is, yeah, so we don't do this, the, when I say we, I don't actually mean me, we. The Roman Catholic Church doesn't do this well today. Right. So if you do something wrong in the Roman Catholic Church and you go and you confess to your priest, what does he normally give you for your penance? What's what's the, the running Hail joke? Mary. Yeah. Hell Mary's and our fathers. Right. So uh, I had this realization with my daughter um, one time when she was younger. She did something that was disrespectful towards her mom. And so I made her write the fourth commandment and its explanation like 20 times or something like that. My thought was in the act of doing this, she'll remember the. The explanation and the act of writing her hand is going to hurt and so there's a little bit of pain in that to reinforce this now after she completed I told her I'd never make her do that again because as she was doing it I realized we do not God's law isn't used we don't teach God's law as a punishment she's gonna hate the fourth commandment if every time she breaks it I use it as a punishment for her but the concept of a little bit of pain it is what penance used to be about. If you were an adulterer, you had to stand outside the church and tell everybody that you were an adulterer. Remember that whole scarlet letter, yeah. the, the book, the scarlet letter? Why did she have to wear the letter A, the scarlet letter A? That was an act of penance. That pain, that shame, that embarrassment made it so that if you wanted to step outside on your spouse again, you might think twice before doing it. That was penance. It was not... It was disciplinary rather than... Yeah. It's not for... So what Melanchthon says here, right? For non-imputation of sin, to get rid of imputation of sin, that's the grace of Jesus. The mortification of the flesh, that's what penance was for. To discipline the flesh. And then in that light, it's not... It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's almost like you take your faith so seriously. So seriously that you do this. Now, could you imagine if you committed a sin in here and you came and confessed, said sin to me, and I told you that your sin was forgiven, but to to give mortification to the flesh, you needed to stand out there with a sign telling what you had done. I I would say it would have to be voluntary then. It would have to be voluntary, which is ironic because what did we just talk about, the word voluntary? It's a movement of will. I'm not going to be like, hey, give me that sign. I'm going to walk out there and embarrass myself. Right. But could you imagine what what people outside of the church who didn't understand this, what they would think about this? That is horrible. How dare you shame someone like that? Even my Lutheran me. I, I get the theological premise of it. Right. But I would feel utterly betrayed if I went to you yeah. under that... Under uh, that guise? Yeah, under that right. seal. Yeah, so I think it's actually different. And then you turn around and be but like... But I think it's I, different. If I you remember the story of the Scarlet Letter, did she come as an act of will, contrite, and sorry for her sin? No, she didn't. She didn't. She was caught in adultery. And thus... The shame that came with being caught, not because she was sorry. Uh, I think that's that's a different thing, right? Um, now, if I were to say, okay, um, you did this thing, now go take a scrub bucket and clean our bathroom, clean all the grout in the bathroom. That would be a painful experience, having to get on your hands and knees and scrub grout, but it may retain things. But we can't even do these. We certainly can't do that type of stuff in the church. We can't, we can't even do it in the military anymore. You do that in the military, they say you're hazing. Yeah. Right? We've become over, so overly sensitive, but we've lost the ability, because we've lost the ability to rightly suffer. We can't rightly suffer. We can't suffer in any way. Um, and that's, that's a big difference. It's a big difference in perspective. Suffering to us is abhorrent. Yeah. 
Definitely. And yet, and yet, what what TV shows are the highest rated? What books are the most bought? The ones that show evil and horror and suffering well, what are of others. All stories. Yeah. Struggle. Struggle and suffering. The climax of that battle, overcoming, and then said struggle. Yeah. The resolution. You got it. So here's the big difference where this, where all of this comes from. If you actually are interested in this and want to read more, go read Erasmus's Freedom of the Will and Luther's Response: The Bondage of the Will. This was the fight between. Erasmus and Luther over the human will. Luther, the human will, is bound to sin. Erasmus, the human will, is free and can assent to God. And so Luther would accuse Erasmus. And if you really like this stuff and you want to go back even farther, go back and read Augustine against Pelagius. Because Pelagius said that the human will is free, and Augustine said, no, it's not. So ironically enough, the Roman Catholic Erasmus <laughs> was more Pelagian than the Lutheran who <laughs> sided with Augustine on these things. Ouch. All right, any yeah, ouch, right? <laughs> any questions on this article? None. Okay. Article three was on Christ, and very quickly affirmed by both sides, and both moved on. Article four on justification. This was a big one. All right, and we're only going to get through the first half of this t- tonight. Um, so, the confutation. Uh, in the fourth article, the Pelagians are condemned, uh, and they think that this is right. However, this is, once again, the confutation. This is the Roman Catholic response. To reject human merit, which is acquired through the assistance of divine grace. So, that is important to note it. The Roman Catholics are saying that human merit is still under the assistance of divine grace is to agree with the Manichaeans and not the Catholic Church. So Manichaeans would say that um, they had a rejection of all human merit at all. Um, and then they, they cite Scripture from here. Um, but here's the big thing. Uh, the last paragraph of the confutation on Article 4. All Catholics admit that our works of themselves have no merit but God's grace makes them worthy. But worthy to do what? Worthy to earn eternal life. Once again, this boils down to this. Human merit. Even if aided by grace. So God's grace comes down and aids human merit. That human merit is what gives eternal life. So, in this Roman Catholic view. So Jesus is just kind of like the steroids for the bodybuilder. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Or he's the, the escalator to get out of the basement. But once you reach the main level, now it's all you. Yeah. Right? The lo- other levels that you're going to ascend to get to God, that's all you. And, Jesus. and it's aided by grace. So, I mean, we can't, lose, we can't lose that fact. They are not saying completely unaided human beings. It is aided by grace. But... That human merit, even aided by grace, merits eternal life, takes away in the Lutheran view from what Christ has done. Now, if you stop the benefits of the crucifixion and resurrection here, you have to have this. You have to have something that you do to merit eternal life. Because then the life of the Christian, Christ's death and resurrection doesn't really impact that. It may give you the grace for then you to, to go and do these things. But this is also why they believe human beings can reach perfection on this earth. Jesus gets you to the first floor. But he after, gets you to the first floor. But, but after that, you're yeah. on your own. Yeah. You, don't get, after, you don't even get out of the elevator. Yeah, whereas, whereas we would say, <laughs> no, G- Jesus is the elevator. Well, you I'm get on in the basement. According and, to them, yeah. Jesus is only getting you. Jesus to drags the you into the elevator in yeah. the basement, yeah. takes you to the top floor in heaven, and yeah. kicks you out. <laughs> right? That's the Lutheran view. Also, the Calvinist view. Yeah. <laughs> Total depravity. We we do we do get in on board with that pretty well, actually. You filthy Calvinist. Um, but this is the hiccup that the human merit can merit eternal life, and that's that's where. Melanchthon is going to come in right from the beginning 
and, and get on, on them. Uh, he is going to say that this is, this is important and important to go because this is, this is where we got, get the article of justification being the chief doctrine of the church, as Melanchthon actually says that here in number two. Um, but since in this controversy the chief topic of Christian doctrine is treated, which understood or right, illumines and amplifies the honor of Christ, which is a special service for the clear, correct understanding of the entire of Holy Scripture. And alone shows the way to the unspeakable treasure and right knowledge of Christ. And alone opens the door to the entire Bible. Thank you, Melanchthon, for being really wordy. And brings necessary and most abundant consolation to devout consciences. We ask His Imperial Majesty to hear us with forbearance in regard to matters of such importance. He's wanting Charles to not simply dismiss because the Roman Catholic delegation said that they refuted this. That it is more, much more important so where, where Melanchthon sees them failing to understand what the Lutherans are saying revolves around the misunderstanding of how sins are remitted, the misunderstanding on what faith is, the misunderstanding on what grace is, the misunderstanding in what righteousness is, and because of the misunderstanding of all four of those things, he says that they obscure the glory and benefits of Christ and they rob devout consciences of the consolation offered in Christ. So the fact that they can't, they don't know all of these things really hampers them. And as a good Lutheran, Melanchthon, where does he found this misunderstanding on? He founds it on an improper distinction between God's law and his gospel. This is really the first big time where law and gospel get unpacked uh, in a Lutheran way. Um, certainly Luther uses these in his Galatians lectures, the distinctions. Um, and will then use them for the rest of his life. But in terms of, of really specifically at um, locating uh, where the Roman Catholics are, are struggling in this, uh, this is where he locates it, is in, a, is in this article in the Apology. Um, and he does this in, uh, in uh, paragraph 5. All Scripture ought to be distributed into these principal topics, the law and the promises. And so he gives a definition of the promises uh, in the Old Testament, the promise that Christ will come and offers for his sake remission of sins, justification, life eternal. Or in the Gospels themselves in the New Testament, when Christ himself, since he has appeared, promises the remission of sins, justification, and life eternal. This is the definition of the Gospel for Melanchthon. Remission of sins, justification, eternal life. Those are the three aspects of the Gospel. He says the gospel can be found in the Old Testament whenever it's pointing towards Christ, who's going to accomplish those things, and in the gospels and then the writings after when they point to Christ who has accomplished those things. And then the law, they designate certainly the Ten Commandments, which is the moral law, but also of the ceremonies and judicial laws of Mo Moses. Uh, although he says these are part of the law, that's not what he's actually reading here. So that's the civil and the ceremonial law. Um, he does give way for a natural law, right? The, um, the natural law that agrees with the law of Moses or the Ten Commandments. Um, but through where he locates the problem is through adherence to this law, uh, thinking that you merit remission of sins and justification. So this is 7 and 8 uh, in the paragraphs. Um, let's see. So when we're talking about civil righteousness, works that you do before man. Uh, once again, always keeping in mind differences in perspective, right? What is righteous in the eyes of man is not righteous in the eyes of God necessarily. And what is righteous in the eyes of man uh, doesn't merit justification and salvation in the eyes of God. We can see that in a very real way that abortion is legal. So in the eyes of man, having an abortion is not... Uh, going against civil righteousness. Homosexual marriage, it's okay in the eyes of man. In fact, it is being held up as being very good in the eyes of, of human beings. So in regards to that, in regards to civil righteousness, if we were to support those things, human beings would praise us for them. That is not the same thing as being righteous in the eyes of God. Uh, quorum Deo, which is the Latin phrase for before God, and Quorum Mundi, before the world, are two different perspectives. 
There may be some overlap, but they're certainly not the same thing, and we can't equate them, and that's what he's saying. Uh, there was, uh, coming out of the medieval theologians, uh, Gabriel Beale especially, uh, he was a student of Occam uh, in what's known as the nominalist school. Gabriel Beale said that uh, a Christian is to, to essentially try their best, to do what is in them, and that is what Melanchthon is actually specifically talking about against in paragraph 9. Uh, but it is sheer hypocrisy. In this manner they teach that men merit the remission of sins by doing what is in them. That is, if reason, grieving over sin, elicit an act of love to God, or for God's sake be active in that which is good. And because this opinion naturally flatters men, it has brought forth and multiplied in the church many services, monastic vows, abuses of the mass, and with this opinion, the one has, in the course of time, devised this act of worship and obedience for the other. So what he's saying is that since we have convinced ourselves that human merit is what provides for remission of sins after baptism, because human merit is what allows us to stand justified in the eyes of God after baptism, then we've created this whole slew of monastic vows and extra services, days of obligation, where you have to be in, in church, enumeration of sins, the whole concept of penance, including satisfactions that you perform or indulgences um, or you know um, pilgrimages or going and touching certain relics. All of those things, this big long laundry list, appeals to us because we like to think that we're doing things to earn God's favor. Uh, and so that, that concept uh, born from the medieval scholastic tradition, especially in Gabriel Beale's writings, this is what Melanchthon is, is going against. That we, This laundry list is meaningless because it is Christ who atones for sin, for all of life. Yeah, yeah. Could some of this... Works to have left that some of that distortion that was going on. What do you mean, Charles? I mean, with the extremists, uh, like Jansenists and all of that. Uh, those, yeah. Those oddball groups, Donatists, and you know, all of those. Yeah. Oddball groups. And they they take this. It. See, this is yeah. This is the the um, all of these these things that I just listed were things that were actually created for good reasons. And I'm gonna, I'll bring into what you're talking about here in a second. So why was, why was the lifestyle of a monk actually come up with? Well, it was because mortification in the flesh is really hard when you're living in the world. When you're surrounded by temptation, it's really tough. And so they thought, well, if we withdraw and surround ourselves with people who want to do this with us, then then we can actually live maybe a, a life pleasing to God. So it actually started for good reasons. Luther fully admits this, that, that they started for good reasons. We talked about this actually um, with, with monastic vows in the Augsburg Confession itself that Melanchthon and the rest of the guys are, are saying that this, it didn't start for a bad reason. But what Charles is saying is that you have these other groups, Jansenists, um, Donatists, that will take them to the, the, the extreme. Um, but even, even that is bred out of the fact that these things are already moving that way, right? When you say, no, monasticism isn't just good for mortification of the flesh, but oh man, it's actually, it's actually a, a way of the perfect life. So to be a perfect Christian, you must never marry, withdraw from society. That's by, by Luther's time, that's where this has gone. So you take this, um, you know, we kind of always talk about things as being a a pendulum swinging, right, to one side or the other. Um, that pendulum swing, when it swings too far one way, something's got to bring it back down. And that is what Luther, Luther is used to do, is to bring, bring the pendulum back down to remove the connotation that has become associated with these things that started as being good. Uh, if you don't know it, there's actually, um, there are a couple quasi-Lutheran monastic orders. You can look them up on, online. But there are people that are, have said, yeah, I struggle with these things, and so I'm going to go be a monk. Um, now, I don't know 
I've never dug into their theology to see how they how they do this, but yeah, there are there are out there. Um, so, um, so then Melanchthon will fire off this set of questions that I think are really great. Um, this is in twelve and following in your paragraphs. So he says, um, "Let the discreet reader think only of this: if this be Christian righteousness, meaning what what." doing what is in you, this idea of human merit. If this is Christian righteousness, what difference is there between philosophy and the doctrine of Christ? So if this is how, philo- or the, um, if this is how righteousness before God is availed, then there is no difference between philosophy and theology. Uh, and then he says, If we merit the remission of sins by these illicit acts that spring from our mind, of what benefit is Christ? If we can be justified by reason and the works of reason, wherefore is there need of Christ or regeneration, as Peter declares in 1 Peter, that we do have need of these things? And from these opinions, the matter has now come to such a pass that many ridicule us because we teach that another, other than philosophic righteousness, must be sought after. So his point is this this anthropocentric, this human being centered view of this conflation of philosophy and theology has caused people to be so turned in themselves that they think that they can do this and in doing so they've actually lost they've lost Christ himself and that's that's what is at stake uh here um and if this is the case if this is the case, if philosophy is no better than theology, then we have actually regulated Jesus to nothing better than a great teacher. He's nothing more than a Cicero or a Zeno. Uh, he's nothing more than Aristotle, just giving us a good way to live. Uh, and that's really what is at stake for Melanchthon here. His death, his resurrection, none of those things mean anything if we are the ones meriting uh, these things. So when we, when we actually talk about merit, then I'm going to erase a little bit of this because we have to talk about a couple terms. Charles, you probably have heard these terms that we're going to talk about. There's two types of merit in the Roman Catholic faith. And these two things come out a lot uh, in these, these discussions. Merit of condignity and a merit of congruity. Big, big words. Uh, two different kinds of merit. And, and Melanchthon's actually, this is, uh, I think, paragraph 19, where he's actually going uh, to say that, that this is one of those, those fine distinctions that they make to try to rationalize these things. And Melanchthon says that the distinction is, is a false distinction. So a merit then of condignity is a merit based on the person doing the work. It's a merit that I earn by the work that I do. So it's very me-focused. That's a merit of condignity. A merit of congruity is one based upon the one who rewards the merit. That's where the merit lies. So in this distinction, this would be in a Christian view, this is very God-focused. So I do, I do the work as well as I can, and because God is graceful, he accounts my effort as merit. And it's, it is something, it's still a merit, it's still a merit I earned, uh, I may not have done it the the perfect way, but I did the best I could, and so God gives that to me he gives as a you merit. Like what, a participation trophy. Yeah, it's kind of like a participation trophy view, and this is why this is why Melanchthon doesn't like it, right? This is this is Beale, right? Do what you can, and then God just kind of covers the rest. But even in this, there's still a me focus on the merit, right? It's me doing what I can. Yeah. God's grace covers the rest. Did, it's I still me. But, uh... And where they're going to say is when we're talking justification, I'm out of the equation. And the merit only comes because of Jesus. 
And it is his act and his merit, not mine in terms of justification. I think you mentioned it once before. If you're doing, if you're asking for even 1%, yeah, you're taking, you're not, you're you're taking not, a percent away you're from Jesus. You're taking 1% yep. away from Jesus. So if the best you can do is only 1%, Jesus died for 100% of your Then he only died for 100% of your sin. What's your question? Um, so, you know, do what you can in terms of justification of the matter, but in terms of uh, um, sanctification. So sanctification, that I think that this is actually, it's, this is a good way to look at sanctification if we get rid of this talk. Because sanctification isn't about my own merit, right? Uh, when I we talk, we wouldn't use the word merit then in regards to sanctification. Yeah, so we would say, what, we, yeah. Yeah, so we would say that the fruit of justification is, is good works, right? That's, that's what flows from justification. In that way, we do what we can, right? We see something that needs to Does be done. Does it depend done. on us, though, for that fruit? To, you know. I think that's the wrong question to even ask in regards to this. Because once we start talking about depending on us, it turns into merit. It turns into merit. And when we talk merit... Um, certainly, we, so when we, when we talk merit, that muddies the waters already, because what are you meriting? What's the purpose of a merit? A purpose of a merit is to gain something, right? But we're, when, once we've gotten into sanctification, we're not trying to gain anything. Man has no merit. Right. We're, we're not trying to gain anything. We're, we're simply doing this because this is, this is the new man, and this is what the new man does. The man should want to do it. Yeah, right. And this is that, that concept of will. So I told you, I haven't quite worked out because I haven't had the time to study it. But I want to see this alignment of will, right? So as, as the Holy Spirit begins to work that, that good work in us, right? This is what St. Paul talks about, that the, he who has begun the good work in you will bring it to completion. So we're, we're still a work. We're in progress, right? But... In this life, the Holy Spirit begins to align our will to God's. Now, certainly, we can rest that will back. We can turn it back towards other things. But the Holy Spirit is trying, trying to get us to align our will to God's. When that lines up, then, then works flow, flow freely from our justification. Does that make sense? But it's a very different way of looking at things than this. Very, very different. And in, in looking at it like this, you can, you can... I'm not asking you to sympathize with the, with the Roman Catholic view, but you can understand why they would look at it and go, this is really different, and there's got to be something wrong. Because <clears throat> this view is radically different than what their view is. Now, well, you, the view is radically different because they've gotten, like we talked about, right, with that, that orienteering... With that one fruit. degree of difference that when we've walked 1,500 years down the road, now we're pretty far from, from the original place we were supposed to go. Luther and the, the re Reformers are, are, you can almost think of it as a corrective azimuth. We've realized we've gotten on track, and now we've figured out how to get back to the box. So the, the Reformation is a corrective that azimuth. With that first set of things you had up there, mm -hmm. I mean, they had to do something to cover this. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and that's, that's what happens, right? You, you make that one degree of separation and you start getting farther away. And the more you have to change things to make your system work and try to be internally consistent, actually the farther away we've gotten from, from the point. Um, and that's a big, big difference. Um, let me see if there's anything real quick that I want. I think it's important that when Melanchthon, he lays this forth and then right, right when we end in 21... Uh, for this week, he says that when, when we do this, when we base our salvation on human merit, that that is, that is faith built on a house of sand. It cannot hold up. Um, and so that's kind of what's at stake. Any questions thus far? We're getting into some serious theology, man. We're getting into some weeds here. And this is, it's good. It's tough. It's tough stuff. There's a lot of background that I, I, without giving you a whole semester course on the difference between the two and justification, we don't really have 
the ability to get into. So you're kind of getting wave tops and every once in a while I'll stick an ankle in to, to get us there. But it's, it's a lot of stuff. Um, and to understand this really and truly, you need to understand um, uh, basically the three main schools of thought coming out of mid medieval theology and the philosophies that they're wrestling with. You need to understand Thomas Aquinas, the Thomistic school. You need to understand Duns Scotus. And you need to understand Occam and Beale in the nominalist school. Those are the three main things that are coming out of the medieval uh, view of things that drive some of this. So there's even different strands within Catholic theology that look at these things a little bit differently. Um, and so it's, those are the big three that, uh, that are difficult. Um, a fantastic book, if this interests you, interests you. Uh, and if it doesn't interest you, don't buy the book and try to read it because it's, it's written by a wonderful man uh, and I get all kinds of giddy over this. But if this isn't your thing, it's not worth it. It's called The Headwaters of the Refor Reformation by a guy named Heiko Oberman. Heiko Oberman is the doctoral father of my doctoral father. Yeah, Oberman is fantastic. But he traces these, these schools of thought and shows you how... Um, how they come together. And I think that's really neat that he calls it the headwaters. If, if you know what a headwaters is, a head, the headwaters is where multiple rivers meet. And so you have these different rivers of thought and they meet together at the headwaters, which is Martin Luther. So they all come together in him for better or for worse. All right. How about we close with the Lord's prayer? Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful evening, everybody.